Ready. Well, welcome to another 4D class. We actually starting a little bit late because I spent the first minutes talking about an upcoming trip we're going to take to uh, basically ancient Puebloan sites all around the southwestern U.S., which I'm interested in these people and how they lived and the phases they went through in their society. So this is uh, <clears throat> continuing with this uh, book that uh, originated with Gerald in, in uh, Berlin in 2019. So I'm going to talk about a really interesting uh, workshop. <clears throat> there, Michael and Finney, who are 4D providers since even before I arrived in China, they they found my my material on online, downloaded the slides, and they've been doing 4D for at least 15 years. <clears throat> they <clears throat> jointly own a company that does this work, and uh, they they asked me to. I think we went to Guangzhou, which is about a two-hour air flight away from Beijing to do a workshop for a Volkswagen. And what was happening is the factory uh, was basically having culture wars, which is really easy to understand if you understand the difference between Chinese and German mindset. The, uh, the Germans, traditionally at least, are very disciplined, very process-oriented, you follow the rules, period. The Chinese are, are, are governed as near as I can judge by pragmatism. If there's a way to do it faster or better that breaks the rules, they do it. So it's, you can learn a lot about a culture watching how they drive. And in China, when traffic backs up, the shoulder becomes the express lane. If the roads, it's like, in, like, like it's more like uh, uh, Italy than any place else I know. So if if the if there's four lanes marked in the road, there's enough space for five cars. It'll be a five lane road, and uh, this is all heavily policed with cameras. And th what they do is they know where the cameras are, and they discipline themselves back into order until they go past the camera, and then spread back out again once they're past it. Going to the airport with a professional driver, <clears throat> he would ride on the shoulder whenever the cameras weren't around, like it was a lane then come back on the highway when when the cameras are coming up. And if you do get caught, the fines are small. So I think, in fact, one time in China that we were trying to get to a restaurant and it was about a most of a block down a street with a, a two lane, a two lane big street with like five lanes going each way. And we went down the wrong direction for about a quarter of a mile against the traffic uh, going the wrong way. And other than a couple of horns honking, nobody thought about it much. So you can imagine these people, they're both sort of equally populating this Volkswagen factory that they're uh, a lot of tension. So I decided to break them into two groups and I didn't want to name them Chinese and German because that's going to aggravate the disconnect. So I called them Mandarin speaking and English speaking and asked all of the Chinese who could understand English to join the English speaking team. So it would be more balanced that way. And I have a method to learn how many people can understand English. I tell a joke and when people laugh at the verbal joke, I, that tells me how many people understand English as opposed to how many people wait for the translation. And I'd say in China, the people I'm seeing, probably 70% of them at least understand English if they don't speak it well. So anyway, so I asked management to move to the English speaking group that they're all English they're all English speakers. And so um, I I proposed the for, for the thing we're going to work in the context shifting worksheet, improve cross team collaboration to maximize performance. The the automobile market in China is as you might expect very competitive. Uh, <clears throat> keeping the cost down is really important uh, because the Ch Chinese don't have as much disposable income as we do in US or Canada. And uh, so when I got to the uh, the, the uh, uh, shared interest piece, I had, I worked with my, my group uh, separately with my translator and, uh, and, and Finney uh, worked with the Mandarin group because she's done 40 workshops 
And, and what, what do they want that we can want for them also? So this was done with a lot of, a lot of good uh, humor. And uh, so, so as I was doing mine and writing it, uh, and I had my translator writing it in English and then writing it in Chinese on the second flip chart. And Finney wrote hers in English and had a translator write hers in Chinese. So we had four, four flip charts total. And we filled them up pretty easily. Uh, when you do this exercise, what what do they want that I can want for them also? I've got to help them along a little bit. But things like uh, we want to produce a quality car at a very low price. Everybody wants that. We want to work together in a mutually supportive way. Everybody wants that. So where attention goes, power flows. You begin to bring attention off of the innate conflicts and in your different worldviews. And just focused on what matters to what's being done here, that is to build these cars and sell them. And in doing so, preserve their jobs and so forth. So when we finished, uh, we took all four flip, chops up, flip charts up on a stage. And I read each of the items in English, and Linda read the same item in Mandarin. And as we went through the flip charts and saw how similar they were, there was just these aha expressions and the lead German manager and the and the uh, his Chinese counterpart just were staggered. This was that they were completely surprised that they had these shared interests because they never thought about it. So comments or thoughts about this whole idea that we tend to look for reasons of conflict rather than reasons to, to work together. One quick question. So yeah. the and apologies if I miss this. The 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 focus of the exercise was each group focusing on what they could want that they thought the other group wanted well, for what, themselves. What, what does the other group want that I can want for them also? Okay, that's what so, I was. This is this okay. is the, this. So just to be clear, this was the, we were going through the whole context shifting worksheet as usual in the workshop. This section was the one that I knew was going to have the, the, the juice in it. Uh, when we, we had set right. this up with situation, outcome, all the normal things we would do, that all that work had been done. What can we appreciate? That was all behind us. We got to this. And so they've been spending like a day getting ready for this, doing other parts of the context shifting worksheet. And, and what we did was we had, whenever, whenever we finished an item and wrote it down on a flip chart, I would interrupt the other group and say, is this something you want, if there's any doubt about it? And sometimes they, gotcha. they, okay. say, they, they might refine a little bit, say, yeah, we'd, we'd like to make uh, low-cost cars, but what we want is to make the lowest price car in the China market. And then we'd talk about that and maybe modify the thing. So... When we got through, the, each group had put their own ideas down, verified it with the other group that it was something they, in fact, wanted, and and had two perspectives that aligned very closely. And then we briefed this to the whole group collectively. And and this is where, I mean, I the, the, the two managers were skeptical about doing this workshop, as they should be, everybody is. But I watched their faces, and and they were like uh, dumbfounded at the level of uh, collaboration that was coming out of this. I think they came up to me and said, "This is worth the whole workshop by itself. This exercise." I explained that you probably should do this again in about eighteen months. I I think it's because of the answer I was fishing for with you guys. I think it was our natural tribalism. Our tribalism was essential to survival in an evolutionary co competition. We we worked together as for our protected our tribe. That's how we survived. And you tend to go back into the tribal thinking. And once you got a Chinese tribe and a German tribe, it's it's uh, you know shields up and phasers armed. Right. So why did you recommend that they revisit in 18 months? Is that we, we, in my experience with aerospace teams is we drift back into the old tribalism. It doesn't last. So, gotcha. Yeah. The the effect doesn't last. Yeah, you have to last. revisit. To, and, yeah. you know, after you, if you work together for 
so let's say five years and did this two or three times, you'd probably cement it, but need repetition to make anything permanent. Uh, the, 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 I put this in here because this was a very moving, this was the, one of the most moving workshop experiences I'd ever had to see this thing totally melt. Uh, what I would say is a, a difference in viewpoint that's profound. Do either of you have applications you could see using this in? Any of you? Definitely. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, I definitely think of a lot of places in the past. Um, <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, I, I think the the challenge that I continue to struggle with is, is getting the buy-in. Um, yeah. you know, how how bad do things need to get that's, that's I, I think that's really what happened here is that they were probably about to strike blows on each other and and, and the, the setup here you know is just is structural I mean a, a German manufacturing company builds a factory in China and staffs it with German managers and has expectations about behaviors that are just not part of how the other party works. So when I heard about this, I was anxious to do it. I thought this would be a good one. It was. Yeah, and it's useful on a personal level as well. If you think about it, when as we go through our own lives, this type of approach is really helping in, I don't know, many different circumstances, even from personal perspective. Yeah, I think that's an important point. I this this works with with anybody. Um, I, I I first started doing this with uh, flight project teams, where the government team and the contractor team were diverging, and running red storylines about each other, and conflict was getting worse and worse. And of course. If you're trying to do anything efficiently, uh, conflict is is deadly. You know, antagonism, communication breaks down, trust breaks down. Unfortunately, it's not hundred percent guaranteed. There are some, like I don't know, but um... no, it's not. And it's it, yeah. I I I I think that what helped this work was that as we're looking at things that both parties wanted. It, it was true for them. They both wanted a successful automobile uh, and very selfish reason. If they can't compete in the Chinese market, plant closes, they're out of work. So they've got, uh, but I think, I think your, not your point's right. They had to be where they were really worried in order to stop and look after this. But the flight projects, it was really the project manager who looked at this and said, yeah, we're doing this. And in that case, the government has the, big stick because they control the fee. In this case, this was more of a, I think a more evenly balanced uh, thing where the, the German manager, the, the Chinese manager probably didn't take kindly to getting bossed around by the German manager. I mean, I can see lots of lots of tension points in here. Uh, you know, it's, 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 you're in China, you're not in Germany. Good. Dorinka, any thoughts? Well, I can, you know what? Uh, some of the things that I always think about is vendor management. So when government hires a vendor, to me, this is this would be such a useful exercise to go through and see what are those points where the goals align. Yeah. And how do you, if there are too many places where goals don't align, what do you do before you start into into projects? And it's like not not only government, but I mean you have any IT projects that are known developments implementations that are known for being over time over budget, and I always wonder what what would have happened if at the beginning yeah, yeah. at some intervals you held exercises such as this one well by the way i i tell people if you're contemplating marriage you better do this exercise 
you got to find out. And uh, the reason my first marriage ended was because we had zero shared interests. If I had known to do this exercise, uh, I think I never would have married her because there were none. Except the obvious one of male hormones and female hormones. But beyond that, that, of course, is transitory at some level. And then you get back to regular life. And so, uh, so I, I actually did this but before I decided to marry Junko. I did a shared interest exercise about our interests. And we had lots of them. And that sort of propels us to this day. They've changed over time. Travel used to be one. Well, I guess it sort of still is. Just now it's in the car. Um, so on your feet. Thank you for remembering that, Charlie. It's always good. <laughs> well, I saw Jarenka inching to get up. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a story that I used to have in the workshop slides. I, After telling, telling it for about 10 years, I got tired of it, so I changed it out. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one. This is a true story. So uh, I'm contemplating... The Hubble servicing mission, and what I'm what I'm realizing is that if this thing fails, we're really going to look bad. And discovered that there was a guy on our payroll at the Space Telescope Science Institute that had written a book uh, predicting the failure and describing the failure that he intended to publish and make money on after the mission failed. So this this annoyed me and amped up my interest in this. So I'm thinking about what do I really not understand about this? So the telescope system, uh, and when I say I, I mean me and the people around me, we understood the, the telescope quite well. It's uh, We knew exactly what happened with the broken mirror. We knew how to fix it. It was straightforward. Uh, it wasn't nearly as technically difficult as build, building the original telescope. But the fact is astronauts are gonna do this in space. And this is, Astronauts can have very great limitations. They're working in these bulky suits with gloves. They're, they're uh, at peril of, of dying if a piece of debris, space debris comes through and hits them at going 18,000 miles an hour. <clears throat> they're, I mean, I, I can't even imagine what they go through to go through the launch and the kind of disrupt and sleep cycle and everything else, the stresses they go through. So. I realized that this was the part that I didn't really know much about. So I decided I need an expert in space operations in general and astronauts in particular. So I talked to the manage my management about it. He said, yeah, it's not like a smart thing to do. So I placed some ads in aerospace magazines and I got a guy who looked really perfect, uh, applied for the job. So I went to see Karen, she's our head of administration. That's a division parallel to mine. And I barely finished t talking, saying I wanted to hire Tim when she said, no way, you look for any gimmick to grow your division and it will not work this time, forget it. Well, um, that annoyed me greatly. We, she and I didn't get along anyway. But uh, when I went, first I just got really angry and I just left and went back to my office and sat there and said, now you gotta cool down and uh, think about this. 
And I realized the reason that made me so angry is that she's right. I would I would try anything to grow the division. I had the biggest division in the organization. I liked it that way, but I wasn't doing it this time. That's not what this was about. So she correctly attributed a motive of mine from the past to something I would have done, but this was not about that. This was about the fact that uh, we could not afford this failure. <clears throat> so my relationship with our mutual boss, Lynn Fisk was great. So I decided it's what we call badge on the table time. And if you're not familiar with this expression, uh, what you do is you go in and put your badge on the boss's desk and ask for what you want. And the implicit agreement is one of you is going to pick up that badge at the end. If he picks it up, you're fired. If, if you pick it up, you got what you wanted. So this is just a way of, uh, of upping the stakes <clears throat> and making it clear. <clears throat> so I care deeply about humble service success. That was really huge. However, I did not want to lose my job. By the way, I, I probably would not have been fired from the federal government, but I would have been fired from my job, which I'm very specifically inclined to, to like. So I thought about the shared interest exercise. What does Lynn want that I could want for him also? And my first thought was he wants a successful servicing mission. Yep, that's right. And and I, I do too. But he wants other missions in his organization to succeed. He's got a planetary missions, earth science missions. All, I'm, I'm like maybe a quarter of his whole program. Need to look deeper. So what else does he want? He wants peace with caring of the director. So if she gives me, if, if I if I get her, him to override her, he's probably going to get flack from my peers saying, how come you let Pellerin do this? You know, I, I, I need a person to you let him push you around or whatever. So I thought uh, Lynn wants never to testify about another Hubble failure. This was a good one. So when the first failure happened, he and I were both called up together. I went by myself sometimes, but he and I together and uh, to these congressional hearings. Now hearings are not hearings. There's nobody hearing anything. Hearings are brow beatings to get votes back home. And nothing does votes as well as to beat up on government officials when you have a failure. So the whole thing was uh, was just punitive. And he got the brunt of it because when he's there with me, they're going to ask him. And I he, he was knowledgeable, but not the depth I was. Sometimes I have to whisper in his ear. And by the way, we had a, a preparatory session for this these events. And what we agreed was that whenever one of these questions came, we're going to imagine someone threw a piece of horse shit at us. And so we would smile and kind of duck a little bit when the question came. That was us naming what they were doing as horse shit to each other. No one else knew what we were doing. Anyway, so um, then I thought <clears throat> the decisive factor would be if in the event of a failure, that he would never have to say he did less than everything he could do to bring success. So... I'm ready. It's time to go see Lynn. So I'm now wait, I'm asking him <clears throat> to roll Karen. So I should also ask, what does Karen want that I can want for her also? This was much, much harder. The first thing she wants is power and control over me. Can I want that too? No way. This is not a shared interest. She can want the ability to do her job without in runs from people like me. It took me a couple of hours to mold this over, but then I could realize I could, I could want that for her. So can you imagine the conversation? I said, Lynn, I'm here because I want to hire Tim. I can tell you the values that are in play here. <clears throat> First, I want a successful repair mission more than a new car, and I really, really want a new car. So that's trying to bring a little glad group into the thing. A little humor helps uh, get, get what you want. I know you want successful mission too. Further, I want to ensure you will never have to testify another Hubble failure again. <clears throat> and even if you did, I would want for both of us to say, you gave me everything I asked for to ensure success. Furthermore, if the servicing mission fails, I will call a press conference and I will announce that I am totally accountable for this and I will resign from NASA. And you can also tell Karen that I will never end run her on personnel. The other thing she controlled was travel, which is important, matters again. Said, so pick up your badge and, and get out of here. You have your hire. 
<clears throat> by the way, I learned early that when you want, get what you want in the meeting, you stop talking and leave as quickly as you can. A lot of people continue to chat on and you lose the thing. So I picked up my badge literally off the table, clipped it on my shirt and walked out the door. What do you think of that? Shared interest. Hmm? Yeah, the 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 amount of preparation I think is kind of what hits for me on that one. Um, just due to the difficult personal uh, relationships that you had to deal with, um, and not something that I probably do enough of um, historically. Well, <clears throat> you know, it. I was days processing this. You know. My, my first reaction was to fight. Uh, I mean, I, I, when I, when she said that to me and I was in her office, uh, I don't, I don't think I was getting ready to strike her, but it sure was on my mind. I mean, I was so mad at her. Uh, you know, my, my cause seemed so noble that I couldn't imagine being turned down the way I, and turned down in a, in an unpleasant way. It wasn't like, boy, I'd like to help. It was, you know, F you, get out of my office kind of a thing. And that's because we had a lot of <clears throat> bad blood over the years. Uh, but yeah, so Nat, I think I may have spent at least three or four days. Uh, I'm still doing my regular work in this time, but this took, you know, in, in quiet moments, <clears throat> One of the things I, I talk about in the workshops is that I had two hours a day of of unplanned time. If if I let, there were so many people that wanted to see me between the science community, other NASA people, people from the Congress, on on on, my own people, the project managers that work for me. That if I if I let my calendar fill up. Uh, it would fill up every square minute of every day. So I thought I needed free time, and it was for things like this. So I had two hours a day of time when my secretary scheduled a meeting. If someone wanted to know where I was, she'd say he's in a meeting, but it was a meeting with me. So that's that's how I had time to do this kind of thing. Move on. Yeah, and it's like for me, I think it's uh the the important lesson is what you said. Once you get something that you want, <laughs> stop <laughs> talking and get out. <laughs> yeah, don't don't ruin it. Yeah, I've that, watched people so many times get what they want and keep talking, and then the thing shifts away. Yeah. You basically then take control of the moment because now that you're gone, you cannot That's lose right. it. But that person will literally have to get up and go running after you. I learned this lesson uh, when I worked for a lawyer. And he told me this. And he said, you know, uh, we we're chatting one day. He said, just one thing you need to know is same thing in court. Once you, once you get what you want, you move on. You don't, you don't. The, the moment can change back. <laughs> Good. The rest of the thoughts or comments? No, I am just uh, still amazed uh, how you manage the whole thing. So, and I always enjoy when you say, uh, sharing those stories again and again. And every time when you share it, there are different nuances uh, just surface. So, yeah. Kudos to you, Charlie, for for being able to communicate it so clearly. Well, here's another one. <clears throat> so, uh, when when I went to Harvard for the the business school uh, residential program, I was still deputy. The, the day I came back, uh, Frank Martin left the job, and I was acting as director. Mm -hmm. But I was, and and it took about four or five months to get confirmed for re reasons I could tell you. The, the 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 guy, the boss didn't like me much because I would talk back to him. I guess I don't know. Anyway, I mean, my community didn't like him because he was basically unfit for the job. But anyway, so at Harvard, um, 
I really got very close to Japanese. We worked in a what's called a can group uh, of, of 10 of us. And I think there's only two of us from the U.S., or maybe three. Everybody else was from a foreign country, Netherlands, England, Japan. And I became very close friends with the Japanese guy in our group, probably closer than anyone else, at, by far I'd say anyone else in the can group. And uh, he, there were five, four of their Japanese in the class. I got to know them very well through him. And uh, when I got back to NASA, I wondered why, why we weren't cooperating with Japan. We had international agreements with uh, both ESA was the biggest partner probably, but Germany was second biggest. Had some, Canada of course was heavily involved, uh, Canadian collaborations. Uh, so the astro NASA's very international program as was the astrophysics division. So I asked people why we weren't cooperating with Japan. And people who were supposedly knowledgeable about this said to me, you can't work with them. They won't share data. And one of the uh, one of the way, ways NASA works is you typically have a principal investigator who provides the instrumentation and uh, and and gets selected in a competitive thing to provide the, the, this. And they they get uh, monopoly on the data for. I've forgotten now exactly, maybe four to six months, something like that. And after that, the data has got to be put in the public domain. So they've got that head start to uh, to write their papers for themselves. But then they, they, it's part of the whole thing. They've got to put every, every all the information, the calibration data, everything, so we can share the data with the whole science community. And I think that's a good thing. And so if people won't share the data, then uh, that's that's a big problem. So I reached out to my counterpart, a guy named Yasuo Tanaka, and it turned out he and I were both going to an American Astronomical Society meeting in Las Vegas. By the way, if they thought they're gonna make a lot of money at the casinos, not with this group, scientists don't gamble. Um, now, g gambling is entertainment for the mathematically impaired, and there are very few physicists that are math or astronomers that are mathematically impaired. So the casinos were vacant, even though we had a thousand people there, I think. So he and I managed to meet up and I said, uh, I want to uh, collaborate with uh, Japan, with you in Japan. And he was deliriously happy. He said, I've been trying for years and nobody would ever, uh, would ever agree to this. And I said, well, what I understand is the problem is that you don't want to share the data. And he explained to me that uh, this was an organization called ISAS, really a wonderful thing. So, so what happened is after World War II, U.S. did not want Japan to have a space agency, but they did permit them to have a space science group housed in the University of Tokyo and, and was uh, called ISAS. <clears throat> so the... They built smaller rockets, uh, and it was a very scientific thing. There, there's no way they could build a military missile, and uh, they do everything themselves. So they don't they, they don't have money to go out like NASA scientists do and hire a group of people to, for example, run the tracking. the 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 tracking of a satellite requires quite a lot of effort. You got an antenna to orient, and you got to have a timeline to capture the data and a certain amount of technical analysis for that and then to record the data stream and process the data so they did everything themselves he said because of that when we launch a satellite i'm not able to go into my office and start writing scientific papers i'm out there working on the site tracking the the satellite and not until the satellite expires do i get a chance to do any science so therefore if we put the science in the book data in the public domain within six months. Uh, I'd never author papers. And of course, if you're in any university, research university, you got to author papers to, to get paid. That's how professors become full professors by publishing. So <clears throat> I, I asked how to, how to move forward if they're dug in. So what does Jasuo want that I can want for him also? Advanced science? Yeah, we're both really serious scientists and scientists uh, above their own interest want to advance science. And I thought that's not enough 
by itself to make him relinquish his publications. That's said for ISAS scientists like him to publish, yeah. And I said to him, the top journals are all in English, right? He said, yeah, they are. I knew this. They were, they are in English. The Astrophysical Journal and so forth. They are the premier world journals. And uh, that's, where he, that's where he needs to publish to, to have any impact and be read outside of Japan. And I, I said, I bet the writing's difficult for you because, you know, they have this uh, uh, kanjis they write in, these Chinese characters that come from ancient times in Japan. And so even though they all study English, it's still an effort to write. And, and you know, the, the language of, of research is not spoken English. It's a whole nother realm of stuff. So I said, suppose I issue a NASA research announcements, and that's a research solicitation, uh, ask finding scientists who really to relocate to ISAS for say a year and co-author papers with you. And you can, even though it's not strictly legal, I'll send you the proposals. You can pick who you want. And he thought that was a great idea. So we collaborated on a mission called Solar A, which is an X-ray mission looking at the sun. And the perfect part of this kind of agreement is that the, the things that I brought were the instrumentation from the U.S. We had uh, some of the best instrument builders here. And, and I got the satellite, the spacecraft, the tracking for free. He provided all the other things beyond the science. So it was very successful. It was uh, renamed Yogo. And uh, Yasuo got a special commendation from the emperor. That's a big deal. And we became lifelong friends over this. So again, the power of just asking the question when things look, look like they're an impasse, what do they want? I can want for them also. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Charlie. Um, you shared that story before, but every time when you're telling us, it's just really a joy to listen. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoy I, I, I At least the way my brain works, I need to hear things <clears throat> over and over. That's why I sometimes repeat myself, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I love, I'm the same way. In fact, Ooh. I love the, I don't like repeating the stuff that I don't like. That's, I have to confess. <laughs> <clears throat> but thank you. Yep. So here's any comments, Nat or Dorinka, before I move on? Good. Okay. None, none for me. Okay. So uh, I've talked about this quite often that, uh, what you should do with 4D material is you should experiment with it. And a lot of it comes from my experimentation with myself. So when I get some new idea, I try to play with it and see uh, what I can learn about it by how I react. So I've told this story before, but I think this is a fun one. So we live in this small gated community with uh, seven houses. And uh, the, the people here have parties from time to time. A detail is that for whatever reason, they like to have lunch at one in the afternoon. And I don't like, I like to go have wine at these kind of events. I don't like to drink in the middle of the day. I, I don't like these events particularly because I have nothing, no shared interest with these people other than we live on the same road. Um, with one exception, they're very different occupations, very different interests. So I don't, Junko uh, <clears throat> and I hate these things. And we do everything we can to avoid them. And the way we normally do it is, I'll when, once I hear they're coming, I'll schedule a trip, usually overseas. So I'll leave the country to avoid these things. So much we both dislike it because this is about being yellow. We're both blues. And we gotta be yellow for all afternoon for a reason that makes no sense. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, one year I hear a party's planned uh, and uh, we did not receive an invitation. And again, pay attention to how you're feeling. I noticed I was becoming angry. And this was really strange. I'm getting, the inclusion need is so powerful, it's making me angry about not being invited if somebody did not want to attend. So this was a powerful learning. So I called the, the people who were supposed to having the party. I said, are you having a party? I said, yeah, we put your invitation in your newspaper box. Well. Well, we we have had had these separate sleeves for the daily newspaper. As we stop getting the paper, we never look in there. 
So now we're stuck with no way to avoid going to the party. No, no, no. Uh -oh. So the, the power of the inclusion need. I do appreciate that story. <laughs> Yeah, I quite uh, often think about it myself. Yes, <laughs> especially when I'm becoming angry with not being included, something that I really don't want. <laughs> yes, it's a powerful reminder of our needs. Yes, that's correct. And and, and it's also when when we organize something, how what do you who do you invite? How do you share information yeah yeah do you expect them to show up or or not and if they do what do you do well you know at the end i'm kind of unhappy about the whole thing because now i can't i've already told them basically that we're available for this thing and i can't i can't get out of it and there's no there's no escape route here so what's the expression hoisted on your own petard or something like that Something like that, yeah. So now, I'm, I'm, now I'm mad at myself. So, um, <clears throat> well, one more. So the power of 100% commitment to purpose. So I've often wondered how I've accomplished much as I have in this really extraordinary life. And I don't remember anybody, teachers or anybody, telling me I was anything special. In fact, the contrary. I had a couple of times that said you're you're not in the league with your friends or something like that. I never got any encouraging thing. And Susan Spiro, Spiro a 4D provider, arranged me to make a lunchtime speak to a large gathering of business people in Dallas. So I'm getting my mind wrapped around making this talk, and this is something that I'm trying to think hard about because what, what I'm trying to do is help her market 4D into this business community. This was people that weren't from from, from from my background at all. And they asked me to, to uh, meet with reporters beforehand. And this woman got me an interview that just completely consumed me <clears throat> until the minute before the speech. And I was greatly annoyed because I didn't have even a minute to sort of think about this thing. I'm going directly from this 20 questions from her to sit down and the food plops down. And so I decide what I've got to do is try and eat something and focus my mind because uh, I've got to get up and talk in a few minutes. So the guy, the guy uh, next to me insisted on talking to me, which also annoyed me. And somehow <clears throat> I remember the subject turning to our fathers and it, for whatever reason, he made me remember something my father said shortly before he died, that he never liked <clears throat> being a soldier. And this was actually <clears throat> quite shocking to me because he was a military pilot for 22 years. And everything that I knew about him was he was 100% committed to the Air Force and his piloting and the whole bit. And so what occurred to me was I must have inherited from him the ability to con to connect to purpose when it mattered and put my personal needs aside, be it Hubble servicing or the Great Observatories or 40 systems. So I think that this ability to came into come into the state of commitment was probably came from the example set by my father. Thoughts, comments? It's interesting how this comes up in the, such an unexpected place in the uh, uh, annoying before dinner speech at, in the business roundtable at Dallas, but that's where it happened. Yeah. The only question I have is um, some of these behaviors that are befuddling <laughs> or challenging. <laughs> um, how do you, do you have, and maybe this is in the material and I just haven't connected it yet, but taking the hundred percent commitment as an example, how do you develop that? behavior as an individual you know i i, I think and that, this may be a bigger question for what we have time for but well the, the, the simple answer is i i well i think i think there's two things one is my brain very easily focuses completely on something and that's why i fell down on the rocks because my brain was so focused on doing the the test with the instrument in my hand that I completely forgot that I had to step over those strings on the ground. Uh, so, but I think the other part is I learned early on 
the, the, the key to this is what to ignore. Uh, by the way, Warren Buffett says the same thing. Uh, if you can learn, if you can learn to practice what to ignore, uh, that's the secret to having space for what to care about. Just decide what you like. I ignore sports. I don't have time for it. I can enjoy watching a football game. I don't rarely do. It's, it's just not good use of time. So, or I'm, I'm conscious of how I spend my attention. That's the short form. That be conscious of how you spend your attention. Okay, stop. Gotcha. Thank you, guys. Uh, if, yes, thank you. If the weather's thank good. You, we're going to be taking that trip next week. If, it's, if the weather's bad, we'll I'll be available for another class. So, so we're skipping one week? Depends on the weather. I'll let you know. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Have a have a great, safe trip, Charlie. Enjoy. Thank bye you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Great bye. seeing Be everyone. Well. Be well. Bye-bye. Great seeing you all. Thank you, Charlie. Thank bye. you all. Bye.